together this morning as we are in the second part of the book of Judges. You see, it's fascinating in this kind of two-part series that we've built up. We did part one a few weeks ago. I uh, did a small group series through that, and then now here we are in part two. And between the two, it's kind of a nine-week series through this book that's 21 chapters long. And you see, today is kind of week six. Week two of part two, but week six of the whole process. And, and oddly enough, this morning, even though we have a few more weeks to go, this morning we're actually talking about the last judge in the book of Judges. And friends, I, ki- I kind of want to warn you in this moment, because there are parts all over the Bible where things get dark. Even in the book of Judges itself, there are moments where things get dark, hope is lost, all those things, and then God steps in and saves the day. And those are amazing stories to read of, wow, oh my goodness, look to see what God is doing. And we've read some of those stories in the book of Judges, and it's been incredible to see how the Lord steps in over and over and over again and rescues His people. But you see, I bring a warning to you, because today is actually the first time where God doesn't really do that anymore. Actually, for the next couple of weeks, we'll read moment after moment where God really doesn't step in. Remember a few years ago in 2018, uh, perhaps if you're in middle school or high school, those are like the old days. Uh, But in 2018, remember the movie that Marvel released, Avengers Infinity War, which now we have this whole like series and saga and all these things that are part of it. But it was one of the first, in, at least in my recollection, the only movie where at the end the bad guy won. I remember going to see that movie. I had loved all, all of them a part of it. And, and I remember, I, I can't remember, Aaron, if you came along too, but came with some friends and went excited to see this opening weekend. And I remember there were rumors of this kind of crazy ending to this movie, but no one spoiled anything for us. And, and I remember sitting there watching this unfold as the bad guy wins at the end of this movie. And you don't watch hero movies to watch the hero lose. You watch hero movies to see them struggle and, and maybe perhaps be the underdog, but then eventually come out on top when all odds are sent against them. And I remember in, in every movie that I've ever walked out of the theater and, and the theater is full of people, right? Everyone's chattering about the movie and people are excited like, oh my goodness, that's crazy that happened. You can just hear the talking throughout the whole theater as everyone's exiting out after the movie and the ro- credits are rolling. But in that movie, everyone walking out was silent as a few hundred people, myself included, exiting the theater still stunned over what just took place. See, again, from this moment on in Judges, the one who was supposed to be the hero actually helps darkness win. And understand, just to set you up for next week and the week thereafter, it continues to get darker and darker as the book of Judges comes to a close. But you see, in week number nine in this series, the last week, we will actually read the foreshadowing of God's plan of redemption that is given to us through the life of a man named Boaz. And it is why the book of Ruth follows the book of Judges. You see, this morning, the last judge we'll talk about is Samson. Perhaps aside from David and, of course, Jesus, I would say that he is probably the most famous person in the Bible. I remember years ago when I was in college and working at Lowe's, I would walk in one day and this kind of big burly guy, he, he, he wasn't a Christian and we had lots of conversations about faith and he would let it known pretty clear that he, he wasn't a Christian, didn't believe any of that Jesus stuff. But one day he came in and he uh, was kind of jokingly came to me and said, Andre, you love my, my long curly hair. What if I never cut it? Maybe I'll get strong like Samson was, right? Even the world around us is familiar with his story. We're familiar with the story of this, this man who, who kind of had this covenant with God and was given great strength, but was all lost through the moment when his hair was cut. 
you see, kind of his story begins in Judges 13. And you see, the Bible actually doesn't skip right to Samson. It first kind of tells us about his mom and dad, this, this couple who were later in life, who were, were hungry and eager to see God help them, needed to see God help them because they had never had a child. And they wanted so bad. And you see, this moment happens where God sends an angel and speaks to Samson's mom and tells him, hey, you're going to get pregnant. You're going to have a son, and I want you uh, to raise him as a Nazarite. This term, this term that, that doesn't speak to Samson having great strength. It's this term that's used to describe people who go extra lengths to belong to God. Other people throughout the Bible are also Nazarites, most notably John the Baptist in the New Testament. A Nazarite is just somebody who, who again, is consecrated, deeply consecrated, belonging fully to God. And, And a part of that rhythm was that they would never drink any fermented drink or eat any food of that, even related uh, to it, like grapes or things like that. They also, too, could never, would never touch the, the dead body of any kind, whether it be a person or an animal. And they would also, too, never cut their hair. And you see, the angel tells Samson, raise, uh, uh, tells his parents, raise your son as an Israelite. And they do, they do, they commit to this. And And then Samson is born, and they're excited. He's a boy, and they're celebrating, and they do what God told them to do. But then comes along the very last two verses of Judges 13, perhaps one of the two, some of the two most important verses in his entire story. It says this in verse 24, it says, When her son was born, speaking again of Samson's mom, when her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he lived in Mehanandan, which is located uh, in the towns of Zora and Ashtaol. Understand, do you see what it said there? The Spirit of God began to stir in him. Now understand this word in this moment, this Hebrew word of Paul Am, it speaks to actually this twisting, actually to this conviction, this this sense of knowing right from wrong inside of this young man. And that matters because everything that Samson is about to do next, he does wrong even though God is twisting in his heart. You see in the next chapter, chapter 14, Samson would travel with his parents to this another region where he would see a Philistine woman. He would tell his parents, I want to marry this woman. We don't know, ever know her name. And his parents try to talk him out of it. No, 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 you can't marry this woman. She, she is of a, she's a Philistine. People of that culture, they, they hate our God. They hate the Lord. Their rhythms, their practices in life are completely opposite that of, of God's way. The way that they sacrifice children, the way that they murder people, all these things that they do are truly evil, which is why God was raising up judges to bring justice to this this nation of Philistines. You see, you can't marry this woman. But Samson said, no, go get her for me. She looks good to me. And you see, as they begin to prepare for the wedding... And you see what's fascinating in, these, in all these pictures I have? For some reason, they're like childish cartoons. Uh, and it kind of makes me laugh because no part of Samson's story is, is what I would say is quite uh, great for a child to read. It, it's not quite a Sunday school lesson. Again, there's not a Veggie Tales story of Samson. But you see, he says, go get them. And while they're preparing this wedding, this moment happens where, where they kind of uh, begin to travel. And you see, there comes this time where Samson is walking then through a local vineyard place that he wasn't even supposed to be in in the first place. And a lion comes and attacks him, and you see, for the first moment in his life, God empowers him with great strength to defeat and kill the lion. As he continues on, there comes this moment where later on he actually returns back to that same animal. Perhaps you know the story. 
He would come back. He would put his hands all over the line. Another thing that, he, again, a part of being a Nazareth, part of being a person who belonged to God, he wasn't supposed to be doing. And then inside of that animal, he found that bees had made a honeycomb. And so if you know the story, he breaks off a piece, begins to eat it. He even brings it back to his parents and shares it with them. In the days leading up to the wedding, Samson makes a bet with these group of Philistine guys, and Samson bride actually betrays him. He helps these guys, uh, she helps these guys actually figure out kind of uh, how to beat Samson, and they do in, in this kind of this bet that they have going on and uh, to solve this riddle, and sure enough, they figure it out because she tells them the answer. And so Samson then leaves. He leaves to go uh, kind of gather all the, the things that he had wagered. He couldn't afford this bet. He bet a bunch of money and a bunch of stuff, and he didn't have anything to, to, to win. But now he goes to take it from somebody else. And while he is gone, listen to this, while he is gone, uh, his bride is actually given away to marry his best man in the wedding. Listen, I'm not making this up. And this is not a reality TV show, but it definitely could be. Because he comes back. He comes back and he finds that his bride-to-be had married someone else and he is furious. And you see the start of the next chapter when Samson returns. He finds out what happens. He is so angry. He catches. He somehow catches 300 foxes. He ties them in pairs with their tails. He adds a torch and he sends them through all these crops and fields to burn down all of this food that belonged to the people uh, the, the, the Philistines, and it belonged to the man who married his bride. Even that, too, was something that was against the way of God. Because whether food belonged to the people of God or belonged to another nation, they were told to never destroy food. That it should be protected. But he didn't care. In return... The same guys that he went and burnt down their field, they go find Samson's bride and they find her dad and they light them on fire and kill them. Samson is full of anger and rage. He kills all these guys and then he runs to hide. While he's in hiding, more Philistines come and they go to the city of Jerusalem to try to figure out where Samson is. They begin to make threats. It says, if you don't hand him over to us, we're going to destroy all of you, all of this stuff. And so Samson's own people, other Israelites, go and they find him. And they say, Samson, Samson, please let us tie you up and let us hand you over to these guys because if we don't, they will kill us. Well, on his way to them comes another very notable part of Samson's story where he finds the jawbone of a donkey. And I just love this picture. I might just make that the screensaver on my phone. But he, he finds this jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand Philistines with it. You see, and then it's actually after that moment, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, it's actually not until after this moment where the Bible actually begins to refer to Samson as a judge. Because in verse 20 of chapter 15, it says that Samson judged Israel for 20 years and during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. Years go by, years go by, and then Samson meets a woman most often, when people talk about Samson, they immediately know this woman's name, Delilah. Hey there, Delilah, how's it like in New York City? You see, he finds this woman. Again, another woman of the Philistine culture who God said, do not, do not marry these women, and he doesn't listen, and he chases after her. Samson is so infatuated with her. And, and during this time, Philistine leaders find out, find out about this woman being with Samson, and they bribe her. 
He says, hey, uh, if, if you can figure out how he has this great strength and you somehow help us take it away from him, we'll pay you a bunch of money. We'll make you filthy, stinking rich. And she says, you got it. And so on three occasions, Delilah comes to Samson and asks, how do you have your strength? How do you have your strength? And, and three times he kind of makes up something. And then she tries to carry it out. One time he says, hey, tie me with uh, some fresh string. Tie me in this way. Do my hair uh, in this sort of way uh, with a loom. And each time she goes and tells the Philistines, hey, okay, he's ready. He's ready. His strength is gone. Come and get him. And then as, as soon as they break in the door, he bursts out of the rope or he gets away from whatever he's tied to and he destroys all of them. But then comes there this moment, the fourth time, where she says this phrase to him, how can you say that you love me but not tell me the truth? Whew. How can you say you love me but not tell me the truth? Well, then Samson caves. He tells her that if his hair is cut, then he loses his strength, and sure enough, she does that, and the Philistines come in, and they defeat him. They tie him up, they gouge out his eyes, and they throw him in prison. Samson's story doesn't end there, but I want us to realize for a moment that Samson lived out anything but what was God's will for him. Samson was given opportunity. He was given power. He was blessed. He was given great strength and favor with God. There's even a moment where he is starving. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He says, God, are you going to let me die of thirst like this? And then God provides water for him. God poured out his favor on this man, and he was supposed to be a Nazarite. He was supposed to be fully devoted, devoted to God. But you see, this man, Samson, he always did what he thought was right in his own eyes. You see, understand in Samson's story, we find a very powerful lesson. And I need to make this clear. This lesson is not that God uses broken people. That lesson is true in so many other stories across all of Scripture. But understand, that is not the lesson of Samson's story. Because understand, Samson's story is of a man who belonged to God, but chose to live how he wanted with no regard to God's will. As we would describe this today, Samson lived a blended life. God lived up to his end of the promise. He said, be a Nazarite. Don't break all of these vows, these promises, and I will bless you and I'll take care of you. All these things. God lived up to his end of the deal. And it wasn't until the very last moment when, when Samson broke all three of the promises with him and God, then God's blessing is then taken away. He was supposed to be a man of God. And I say supposed to be because he was called to from such an early day by his own parents who even tried to help him. But you see, in every situation, after the moment when the Holy Spirit began to stir inside of him and bring conviction and moral code to his soul, in every situation that followed, he did what he thought was right in his own eyes. Both times, he chose to pursue women to marry that God said, don't do, but he didn't care. In all the moments that Samson uses his great strength, there was only one moment where God used it to help God's people. And that was the moment with the jawbone of a donkey. When these people were threatening, they were threatening Jerusalem, they were threatening the people of God, and then, and then Samson goes and destroys his whole army. And it's not until that moment he is referred to as a judge. Because every other time, every other time he uses his strength, it was for personal revenge. It was for selfish motive, selfish gain. Even when he lost the bet with the guys at his first wedding, he goes and he, he, he loots and kills all these Philistines to take all their money and take all their stuff to pay the lost bet. There's a moment I didn't mention earlier when Samson, before he meets Delilah, he goes to a local Philistine village called Gaza, which is far away from his home, 
and he goes there to find a prostitute to spend the night with. And Scripture tells us this. And then later on, he meets Delilah there. And she's actually after the woman he already was with, and there's a whole lot of drama going on there. But, but not once in his story does he ever ask God, what should I do? He never asks God, what do you want me to do? Because Samson didn't care. He always did what he wanted to do. And Samson is the prime example of what happens when we try to blend in this being a Christian while doing what we think is right in our eyes all of the time. Letting our will trump God's will in every decision. In church, there are three. There are three core realities of what happens. We experience this in our life, but it is evident in Samson's life when we live a blended life. First off, that a blended life, understand, will be empty of wisdom and full of bad decisions. Scripture refers to it as foolishness. I mean, did you pay attention to Samson's story? In both women that he pursued, both women betrayed him. Even Delilah betrayed him like several times before they actually caught him. All the red flags were going up in these women he was pursuing, and he ignored all of these red flags, and it ruined him. He made a bet he couldn't afford. He acted out of selfish anger all of the time, and it got people he loved killed, especially his first wife or his first bride-to-be and her father. He acted without thinking about the consequences that he would go and burn down fields and he'd go and he'd attack people and then the Philistines would send an army to destroy his home city. Understand, we live in a day and time and we are obsessed with information and knowing things. And we have to understand that there is this reality we live in where, where we are the most aware people ever to exist. Remember when Inside Out 2 came out earlier this year, uh, there were just some podcasts and some blogs that I was reading about at the time. And it's fascinating. We are the most self-aware people ever to live. We are the most informed people to ever live. But yet we continue to experience great hardship and great pain. And even though we are aware of our circumstance or aware of our self, aware of our patterns, aware of our mental health, nothing changes. And that is where God dries, draws a, a very cold, hard land, line in the sand. And he wants to say, no, no, information and self-awareness even is not the goal let me bring my wisdom into your being. Understand that wisdom is the combination. It's defined in a whole lot of ways. But it is the combination of wholesome understanding and action. And let me also say with that, there is nothing that is not of God that is wholesome. And when I say wholesome, I mean good for us. It is good for our well-being. There is nothing that is not of God that is wholesome. Everything that is wholesome is of God. Understand that a person is only considered wise not because they know something, but because they actually have taken it and applied it to their life. Remember at the beginning of Samson's story, the spirit was stirring in him trying to lead him towards what is good and what is whole, what is good for him. But in each moment, he chose not to follow it, and it led to disaster. When we try to cling to God, but we also blend in, no, I want my way or the highway, what comes out on the other side isn't half good and half bad. It is all unhealthy. When you take a salad and you toss in a Twix bar, you don't make a half healthy food and a half bad food. No, you've just made a wholly healthy item all bad. Understand, it is why Christians 
often struggle in our dating world because we blend in being a Christian with our way of dating. And it brings us to such a mess. That's why Christians live in a constant state of financial struggle because we try to blend in being a Christian with our way and our ideas of handling money and if we live paycheck to paycheck, we owe all these people money, we have debts up to our eyeballs and we are struggling and we're drowning, we're working overtime and we never catch up. That's why we have tossed out God's values of finances and his ideas of being generous and giving and being selfless and being stewards, all this stuff, and we've experienced great, immense pain. Why Christians are crippled often with mental health problems because God says to live healthy and build a healthy life and get support where it is needed, but we say, ah, now I'll ignore it. We can trace nearly every piece of preventable hardship to our unwillingness to submit to God's wisdom. It's important that we understand that. And I don't say that to, to, to heap shame or remorse on people. We'll speak to that later on. But understand, we have to call it how it is in our life, in my personal life, in the times that I am most stressed, most overwhelmed, most at my end. It is because I have interwoven my following of Jesus to doing things my way. What is very obvious in Samson's life, the second core reality, is that a blended life will be empty of peace and full of fear. Samson is angry a lot. He is also lustful a lot. We could go down the list of all the emotions that he's experienced but understand, especially speaking to the one about anger, understand that anger is not a primary emotion. Anger is a secondary emotion. We, we, we lean into anger because we actually feel something else. The reason why Jesus in so many moments told his disciples not to be afraid is because oftentimes when fear creeps into our soul or our mind, it leads us to something else. Parents enable their adult children's bad behavior by giving them money or helping them and giving them, giving, you know, when they're not being financially responsible or they have an addiction or they're refusing to grow up, whatever it is, parents enable their adult children because they're afraid of what will happen to them if they don't. They don't realize that their loved one will never change when they're enabling them. And also, too, that by them helping them, they're actually sinking the dagger deeper into their heart and their life. We respond in unhealthy ways in our life when we feel afraid and we've lost control. When we're afraid of feeling alone or rejected or unloved or that we have no friends and that no one cares about us, it brings about all this unhealthy stuff in us, when we're afraid of losing something we love, or afraid of losing a job, or an income, or security, or whatever it is, then all sorts of emotions come out in our life that lead us not towards peace, towards pain. Understand, even through life's most difficult circumstances, people who are following Jesus can experience great peace. That's what Paul speaks about in Philippians chapter 4, how he says, I have known great and I have had great and I have been in prison and had nothing, but I have been content. And so when he speaks about uh, this peace he has in his soul, he, he says that wonderful verse in chapter 4, verse 13, that I can do we can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not to go dunk a basketball, but to be at peace when life is whirling and spinning out of control. Don't be afraid is what Jesus says often because he knows that out of fear we spin into so many things. We can't control what other people decide to do. 
We can't control how people see us or if they respect us or if they love us. We can't control if our business that we've sacrificed everything to start is going to make it or not. We can't control what happens to us. We can't control what happens to our, our body, our health, and even the health of our loved ones, which is why God invites us to trust him. Because that maybe I'm the only one in the room, but I know if I sit and I, and I, and I ponder and I've not been spending time alone with God, I know my mind can wander into all the things that I am afraid of. And it will consume me. And it will drown me. And I again have to come back and say, God, I trust you with all of this, with my kids, with my marriage, with my health, with all of this. God, I trust it with you. And that is when his peace comes into our soul. We won't ever know it. We don't let go and trust and hand over to him whatever it may be. Blended life will be empty of peace. And it will be full of fear. Lastly, what is very evident in Samson's life is that a blended life will be empty of redemption and full of ruin. See, there's still a part of his story that I haven't told you about yet. After the Philistines grab him, gouge out his eyes, and arrest him, he's brought to a dungeon, this prison where he is kept in darkness for so long. And then comes a day where the Philistines are having a festival, and so they bring Samson out. And you see, there comes this moment where he's brought out for entertainment, and everyone's watching, and perhaps you know the story where he gets put up against a pillar that suspends the roof structure, and he asks the Lord, God, give me my strength back so I can push over this pillar, kill all these Philistines, and take myself out too. And so it happens. You see, Samson thought that was his only option. In our culture today, we would describe that as noble or brave. But I would argue and say, what is God's preferred ending of Samson's life? You see, because there's a special verse that comes before this moment after he's arrested. You see, it says this in verse, uh, chapter 16, verses 21 to 22. It says this, so the Philistines captured him, gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains, forced to grind grain in, this, in the prison. But listen to this. But before long, his hair began to grow back. His hair began to grow. As a Nazarite, when your hair is cut and it begins to regrow, you then have the chance to start again. If Samson would have humbled himself and said, God, save me, you see, I'm convinced that perhaps the Lord would have rescued him in this dark moment of his life. when All hope is gone. I'm convinced if he would have asked God, I'm sorry, would you rescue me? Would you save me? I believe the Lord would have. But instead, Samson, still in that last moment, he told God what to do. You give me strength and I'll push this over. But man, if his heart would have been different in that dark moment, if he would have said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Have all of me. I believe God's preferred ending for Samson would be entirely different. That his life would not have ended in ruin, but he actually would have experienced great redemption. You see, understand we turn this corner where we're at through this word called repentance. Understand, we don't use this word often in our modern worship, but understand repentance speaks to these two very real things, needing God and turning to God, is repentance. Understand that repentance is more about returning home than it is about being filled with guilt. There's this wonderful moment in the Gospels where Jesus shares this this story of this young man who came to his father one day and demanded his inheritance and, and, and went off and squandered all of it. 
when he had lost all of his money, he would slept with all of his women, and he had done all these things, and he just experimented with life. Then he came to a moment where he said, I'm eating pig slop. Maybe my father will let me work for him. And so he rehearses this apology narrative in his mind, begins to walk down the driveway back home. And what happens in the story? His father runs out before he could even say a word of, I'm sorry. His father runs and embraces him because Jesus is trying to cement it into the minds of his people that repentance is more about returning home, coming back, than it is about being overwhelmed to shame or guilt. See, that's the beautiful thing because there's no one in the world who's like our God who gives out second chances. And even if we're on our millionth second chance, he's still quick to give it. That is how good he is. And if Samson would have known it, you see, it's not until after the roof caves in on him, kills him, that his family comes to dig out his body and bring him home. Don't wait until the moment of when you feel like it needs to come to an end. Come home. I don't know what is secret in your life. I don't know what fighting is happening between you and God. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you that you cannot live with a blended life. Because there is peace waiting on the other side. I'm telling you, there's one who has tried. Remember, I was in a season of my life in high school. And I felt this immense tension in my life where I was involved in church but doing things my way. And I remember, I was driving down the road late at night and my, my heart was just being ripped apart. And I had this thought, if perhaps as I came around this curve on the road, if perhaps the car just happened to lose control, and if my seatbelt had been undone, then I just began to think about the stories they would tell about Andre. We have these noble ideas that come into our mind of this self-sacrifice, self-defeating, in some way getting to make up for all of our wrong. But I tell you, I tell you in that moment, the Lord said, Andre, if you let me show you what life will be like around the curve, please change. And there in that driver's seat, my heart was filled with love and peace. Sometimes we don't mean for it to happen. Sometimes life gets busy, we get distracted, and we start going through the motions and we begin to blend our way with trying to follow God. I tell you to come home. Whatever darkness you feel like you're trying to hide or make up for, let Jesus help you. He isn't looking to cover you in shame. He isn't looking to beat you down. He's looking like to be the father who embraced his son and just said, welcome home. Friends, I encourage you. We need to embrace again this, this habit of repenting, this habit of needing God, turning to God. Perhaps we've been walking with God for a short while, or maybe we've been walking with Jesus for 30 years. This act of repentance is for all of us in all moments of our life when we start to blend it all together. Friends, I urge you, I don't know where you are, but allow the Holy Spirit to flood inside of you to bring his peace, to bring his healing, to bring his purpose and redemption into your life. Because my goodness, 
His wisdom, His freedom, His love will bring you to a place that is so whole you couldn't even imagine. 